I know we don't want to think about this, but can we imagine that if our isolation and social distancing that we are practicing right now will last all the way till right before Christmas? Finally, after months of isolation, where we have become used to as the new normal, we have a chance to once again gather all together again at Grandma's house for Christmas dinner. The months of social distancing and isolation will have felt like years probably and make us wonder if we'll ever be willing to gather again as Christmases that we've had in the past. What a difference a year will have made in each of our lives. We will have been forced to reevaluate our priorities as possibly jobs were jeopardized or lost. Trust in the economy will have been weakened and it will seem that it will take years to recover and possible grief even over loved ones who have gone too soon because of COVID-19. Events that have happened that have made us even question God's goodness or where is God in all of this? And leaving us with maybe many more questions than answers about faith. Many of us will feel a part of us will have been cut off, making us possibly lame or blind in how to proceed in the future. While I'm not trying to predict how long our difficulties will last, and I sure and hope pray that we don't have to wait till Christmas to gather it again, together again as family and friends. Yet I believe if we had to wait until Christmas, what a celebration Christmas would be, even if it was a humble time. Who knows whether we would have the grand turkey dinner, if we could afford it, or what it would be available at the time. The presents under the tree would probably be possibly minimal, or even handmade items. But I don't think any of us would mind as the joy of gathering together, the touch of friends and family, and the simple feast will seem extravagant with the love of being together. No more, I believe, taking for granted the gift of presence, as in God's presence, which will be a lesson I pray that we all will learn through this time. The Apostle Paul was shared some of the early difficulties the church went through in his lifetime in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, We were hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. He says, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is also in work in you. Such is the type of celebration that spontaneously happened when Jesus rode humbly on a donkey into Jerusalem during Holy Week. Matthew sees Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a celebration of Jesus coming as a humble king. It says, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. You would expect a king in Jesus' time to ride in Jerusalem victoriously on a horse-driven chariot, or in our day, a vast motorcade. As I was filming the children's story with the donkeys, Jack, the, farm, you know, ran, the farmer there, was bringing out one of his horses to pasture in the nearby field. Even the colt was, was only about a year old, I believe, but it was a magnificent animal, and it towered over Jack. He asked us to be quiet. As the colt was so powerful, Jack didn't want to be distracted, as the colt could easily have pulled Jack or anyone where it wanted to go if it so willed. What a contrast between that horse as a symbol of power and might 
to a donkey, a common person's animal. Jesus' words near the end of chapter 20 really illustrate his purpose in coming to Jerusalem during that holy week. Verses 25 to 28. You know that the rulers, he says, of the Gentiles lord it over a people, and their high officials exercise authority over them. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, Jesus himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even though Jesus had come gently and humbly to give his life in service to God's plan, the crowds were excited about Jesus' coming, hoping he would be the king who would overthrow the foreign occupation of the Roman Empire. Luke's gospel story shares the story of two men who encountered Jesus after his resurrection from the dead and didn't know it at the time, who said these words to Jesus, but we had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel. During this time of COVID-19, we too have expectations of Jesus as the king. We hope that Jesus will protect us from the virus, bring healing from the virus, and help our life to get back to the blessings we have enjoyed in times past. The Jewish people would have loved for Jesus to usher in a kingdom of prosperity, such as the time of their ancient King David. What do they shout to him? in his entry parade, Hosanna, which means save us, and which they quoted in Psalm 118, to the son of David, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 18 was part of the Jewish songs and prayers that the Jewish people prayed and sang as they ascended on a yearly pilgrimage to Jerusalem for their religious festivals. The longing for this king to come and save them was so strong that many joined in the cries of Hosanna that such a crowd gathered in unity and expectations of Jesus as such a king that the whole city, it says, was in a stir. The Greek word for stir is the same word as seismic, as in an earthquake. The city was in an uproar, as if the earthquake was happening with Jesus coming in. What God values and what we value can be quite two quite different things. The COVID-19 situation that we are in can be a good time for us to look at what we really value as most important in life. The Jewish people valued their identity as a people in prosperity as a nation, and the temple became this symbol that showed off God's blessing to them as a nation. If only God would make them a prosperous nation again, expelling the Romans, and the temple would be the temple it once was, as in the past. That was their cry. Do we as Christians have symbols of God's blessing that we cling to as well? I remember seeing pictures of St. Paul's sanctuary from the 1950s, so full of people that it is standing room only. Now today, as I speak, our beautiful sanctuary, it is a beautiful sanctuary, but it sits empty. The Jewish people felt the same way about their temple. Sometimes a value such as preserving a building of worship can overshadow and become such a priority that caring for people's spiritual needs becomes secondary. I do find myself in this time more concerned and thinking about the people of St. Paul's as people whom God deeply cares for and wants to bring healing to in, during this time. A healing is sometimes needed for the church to value what God desires, a realigning to our priorities. This is what happens when Jesus enters the temple area. The area where non-Jewish people would come and worship God had become secondary to people providing for the Jewish pilgrims. Traveling to Jerusalem, they needed supplies for their worship and sacrifices. 
I could imagine the Jewish people justifying what had happened to the temple area by saying something like the following. Well, you know, those non-Jewish people want nothing to do with God. And they definitely don't financially support keeping the temple going year after year like we do. We need some more space to provide for the many Jewish worshipers. Jesus values people finding their spiritual needs met and worship to God. He cleanses out that temple, calling them and us and our churches as well to once again realize that God cares for people from all nations and people and their spiritual relationship with God and each other is God's number one priority. Jesus quotes Isaiah 56. He says, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love him, and love the name of the Lord, to worship him, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus is making this promise come true as he cleanses the temple so non-Jewish people can come to God and worship him as well. That's why we need to celebrate these Jesus' correction because he isn't out to harm them, but he's correcting us to helping us to understand God's value in life and values for us. The early church, after the resurrection of Jesus, realized that we, believers in Jesus, are the place of God's Spirit, that temple. We are God's temple, this house of prayer for all nations. In this time of COVID-19, let God cleanse you and your priorities once again to be in line with the heart of Jesus, to love God and each other above every, anything else. We shout what? Hosanna, God save us. Praise the God who saves and comes into our lives to cleanse and heal. What happened after Jesus cleansed the temple? Those lame and blind, traditionally kept out of the temple area and forced to beg from the Jewish worshipers who were coming into the temple, are healed and brought into the temple as whole people. Children as well, who were secondary in the usual temple worship, were now leading the praise and choruses for Jesus. Not everyone, of course, is excited or encouraged by Jesus cleansing the temple area. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were quite indignant, Matthew says. Indignant is a strong word of anger. The chief priests and teachers of the law had a quite different vision and purpose of the temple than Jesus. The leaders were losing control and their place of secure status as key leadership in the temple was being challenged by Jesus as being corrupt and needing renewal. Holy Week is a chance to follow Jesus as we journey with Christ as Jesus cleanses us, helping us reprioritize our lives, homes, and our church community. This path is not a path we are always want to travel upon, as it is a path of giving up other priorities that have, we have in our lives instead of God's. The path of leading us back into a relationship with God and each other is a path of sacrifice, and the cross is where the path led Jesus. Praise God, Hosanna, that Jesus comes into this blind man's and lame man's heart. He opens my eyes to see Jesus coming to cleanse me and giving me his life so that I can love God and you. This same Jesus today is coming to you. Let's pray. Hosanna to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. For our Lord Jesus is marching into the temple of our human hearts. You see us hiding in the shadows of fear, being hard-pressed and perplexed by the situation of COVID-19. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hear your words of joy that call us back to your side 
as we follow you in this time. Help us, Lord, to see your coming, the children singing and shouting praise, the blind given sight, and the lame able to walk and skip as you cleanse the temple of everything that keeps you and keeps people from experiencing your love. Help us, Lord, as a church to bring your hope to those who are feeling crushed, perplexed, and in despair from COVID-19. We place those who are risking their lives to fight this disease, the medical staff, our government, officials, and all essential workers in your loving protection, Lord Jesus. We place them in our hearts now right before you. And may our homes, Lord, our homes become a prayer, homes of prayer for all nations as your spirit dwells within each of us. Help us to live by your values and prioritize our lives on your eternal values that will last forever as we serve and love one another. Hosanna to the Son of David, our King, whose love displayed in this holy week so long ago still speaks to us today and gathers us foreign people without hope to have the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.